This is one part of a two-part video on the existence of the soul. At the end of this video, make sure to check out the other bit. If the soul is purely supernatural, how does it influence the natural world? If it does exist, one would expect the soul to leave traces of its existence. In 1901, a physician in Haverhill, Massachusetts attempted to prove just that. His name was Dr. Dawkin Mc... Dr. Duncan... Dr. Dawkin McDougal. Dunk. His name was Dr. Duncan McDougal. Say that 10 times fast. He performed an experiment to check for the existence of the soul by testing to see if it had weight. He placed the beds of terminally ill patients on industrial scales, attempting to account for air in the lungs, bodily fluids, and sweat evaporation. Dr. McDougal determined that at the time of death, the soul loses 21 grams of weight. The weight of the soul. Or so he thought. But there were a few problems with the experiment. Dr. McDougall's sample size was tiny. Unlike modern day clinical trials that examine hundreds or thousands of cases, McDougall studied only six patients. The 21 grams result occurred in one of the six patients, who he reported as losing three fourths of an ounce on a scale that was only sensitive to within 0.2 ounces. That means that 83% of the patients he studied yielded a different result. Now two others did lose weight at the time of death, and then more weight shortly after. Patient two lost 28 grams at the time of death, and then another 18 after they determined that the heart stopped for a total of 46 grams, while patient three lost 14 grams at the time of death, and then 28 grams several minutes later. Did their soul packets evaporate in chunks or something? Lastly, patient five lost 11 grams of weight and promptly gained it back. A yo-yo soul. They stayed dead though. With results like that, if this was a high school science project, it would have gotten a failing grade. Oh, wait though, didn't I say that he studied six patients? Yeah, well, according to McDougall, patients four and six died before he could properly adjust slash calibrate the scales, so he disregarded these results entirely, and the other three, and selectively reported his findings based on the one data point that confirmed his bias. Which brings out another flaw in the experiment. Dr. McDougall set out to prove a belief that he held rather than to see if he could disprove his hypothesis, which is how science works. And it wasn't a blind trial, meaning he could easily influence the results or selectively report on whichever data points matched his bias, which is exactly what he did. Not only that, but McDougall didn't even have an accurate way of determining the exact time of death. Does the soul leave when the patient breathes their last breath? When the heart stops? Or when the brain activity ceases? But e even if his scales were precise and accurate, which they don't seem like they really were, and his methodology was sound, which it wasn't, the body losing weight at the time of death is in no way confirmation of the existence of a soul. If it's ethereal, why would a soul even have weight? Why would half the soul evaporate, delay, and then the other half flitter on down to hell? Why the weight discrepancies? If some souls are fatter than others, will you be chunky in heaven? Why are some souls slower and others faster? If a soul has weight at all and isn't lighter than air, how can it float to heaven? And speaking of heaven and hell, what if someone suffers a personality altering brain injury and also develops severe retrograde amnesia, forgetting everything that they know about religion up to that point? Previously, they were a bit of an obstinate and self-righteous twat waffle, but are now pleasant, selfless, and kind. When presented with religious teachings though, the beliefs they were raised with and once held dearly now seem preposterous to them. They reject them entirely. Is their soul judged as pre or post amnesia them? Do they go to heaven, hell, both or neither? Or a severe brain injury leads a patient to develop anterograde amnesia. And all of their 50 years of memories as a godless heathen are now preserved, but they're no longer able to form new memories. Their procedural working memory is intact, allowing them to live in the moment and have brief coherent conversations with someone, conversations that they promptly forget. In several different conversations, they enthusiastically accept several different religions presented to them and then immediately forget their newfound faith. If the soul is separate from the brain, does their soul forget its religion? By this point, you may be questioning traditional concepts of the soul, but perhaps you or someone that you know had a spiritual experience. Are these not a glaring example of the existence of something beyond this natural world? Or are spiritual experiences simply a concoction of our brains? 
If spiritual experiences are a fluke of the brain, we would expect to be able to recreate them by physically tampering with our cranial baloney. And we've done just that, creating spiritual experiences and even out-of-body experiences using magnets, electrodes, centrifuges, and drugs. I cover all of that more in depth in my video on near-death experiences. There are so many other neurological oddities in clinical cases, or even viruses, which I could cover that affect the mind. Strokes, temporal lobe seizures, brain injuries, or disease can alter people's personalities and impair any and every neurological capability we possess. If the soul exists outside the physical world, why is it so prone to physical damage? Where does the soul even reside? And if the brain accounts for all functions previously attributed to the soul, functions that can and are impaired by brain damage, Damage, then what's even left for the soul to do? Some people argue that our internal monologue, that inner voice in our head that we hear when we think, is the communication of our soul. Except that some people don't have an internal voice at all, and others have more than one. Still, others attribute our conscience to the soul. But do psychopaths who lack a conscience lack a soul? Psychopaths often have either smaller than average amygdalas or amygdalas that don't function properly. If you were to damage this region of a non-psychopath's brain and it resulted in them losing their conscience, did you just slaughter their soul but leave their physical body intact operating as a living soulless meat sack? Demonstrating the superfluous nature of the soul? And do animals have souls that live on after after death? If so, where do they go, heaven or hell? If they go to hell, what a cruel god. And if they go to heaven, does God love animals more than humans to give them a blanket pass? And if they don't have souls and are purely controlled by their physical brains, then why do humans need souls to do largely the same things? And if we are controlled by a soul, a man in the machine, a supernatural puppeteer pulling the strings, what allows that little homunculus of a soul to think? Does it have a mechanical chemical brain? Or does it have a soul doing the thinking for it, which has a soul doing the thinking for it, which has a soul doing the thinking for it, and it's an infinite regress of soul turtles all the way down? Now, some people will argue that we've mapped the brain, and a few functions of the mind have not been pinpointed to a specific brain region, therefore souls. But that's about as ignorant as claiming that because we've mapped the human genome and haven't found the height gene, that height isn't influenced by our genes. Just as with genetics, where multiple genes can affect one trait, in neuroscience, multiple regions of the brain work together to give us each brain function. Our knowledge of the brain is far from complete, but that doesn't mean that you can fill those gaps with whatever the fluff you want. Neuroscience itself is a very new field, and we've really only had the technology to look under the hood for a few decades, filling the few remaining holes in our understanding of the brain with, we don't know for sure, therefore the soul does it, is a soul of the gaps argument that becomes vanishingly arguable as we fill the pieces of the puzzle. Now I'm not here to tell you what you should or shouldn't believe about the soul, just to urge you to think about the hard questions. Dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid. Now don't forget to check out the other part of this two-part series on the soul where I explore the arithmetic of souls. There's some pretty soul-blowing interesting clinical cases you don't want to miss. And if you enjoyed this video and would like to support more videos like it, you can make a one-time donation on PayPal, the link to that is below, or a per-video pledge on patreon.com slash holykoolaid of any dollar amount. Most people pledge a few bucks a video, that's the equivalent to a cup of coffee or two a month. Patreon is kind of like the internet's tip jar. Your support allows me to make more videos like this one full time. So if you haven't become a patron yet, please consider becoming one. And in exchange, you'll get certain perks depending on your pledge level. And if you already are one, thank you so much for your ongoing support. You freaking rock. And as always, dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid.